Welcome back, everyone. I hope lunch was, was good. So just a little recap before we hand the mic over to Ted Ames. Um, just to bring us back into it, I hope everyone has noticed perhaps the watershed effect happening here today. Beginning this morning, up in the, um, the headwaters, <laughs> in the Maine woods, up there in the northern Maine woods, moving down through the rivers, and now we've been in more of the coastal climates and uh, locations. And so later in the day, we're going to continue moving on and end up back in the main woods. So without further ado, we'll hand it over to Ted Ames. Welcome. Thank you. I have to point out, though, the, all of the baggage that we have on here. I, uh, I'm wearing glasses. I have a hearing aid. Now I have this. I'm the bionic man. The only thing I'm missing is a cane. <laughs> well, thank you. My talk today is about linkages between marine and aquatic ecosystems. In particular, I've examined how the pursuit of diatomous prey species, like uh, alewives, uh, uh, affect the distribution of at Atlantic cod and their, their spawning groups. Uh, many factors have been involved in the disappearance of cod along the shore, uh, particularly in northern Maine. Uh, overfishing, pollution, climate change, just to name a couple. But there's never been a clear understanding of what caused cod groups to form along this coast in the first place. Well, I decided to look at this, and quite frankly, I found more than I bargained for. Uh, my involvement with it started when a large cod tagging study in 2007 reported that there were no tag returns in northern Gulf of Maine. Note how well the, uh, the place where there's no cod correlates with Maine's major river systems. It raised some questions for me. Could those changes in distribution of cod be linked to changes in alewife abundance? A recent study by Rose, George Rose uh, at DFO, reported that cod aggregated and remained in the same place for long periods of time where capelin were abundant. They stayed so long that it gave misleadingly high catch per unit effort uh, uh, calculations, and they became overfished. Richardson's group in Woods Hole uh, just this past year reported um, a very similar event on Stellwagen Bank with uh, Sandlands. Uh, and again, the fish stayed very close to this uh, concentration of large concentration of lipid-rich prey, and uh, stayed so long they uh, were overfished and became depleted. Could this have been the mechanism that caused cod to form spawning groups along the coast to start with? and then left because the concentration of their preferred prey uh, had diminished too much? Well, to look at it, I use the historical population structure of cod. Um, this is the 1920s population structure, so everything that proceeds from this point has to be held up in that light. But if you're going to examine codfish in an area where they haven't been around for the last 20 years, you have to start back somewhere. And I had this very good database. This shows where uh, cod used to be and where they used to reproduce along the coast. 
I looked at this more closely, and uh, here's where the spawning groups uh, that uh, the TALIC study missed in the 2007 tagging study. Uh, note there are eight spawning components that disappeared along this section of coast. That's as many as existed before we started losing them from Casco Bay South. It's a sobering number. So I pushed the envelope a little farther, and I said, well, I'll draw a circle around those, uh, those codfish groups that uh, appeared to be linked to particular rivers. And here's the three, uh, the pink circles. The uh, tagging results are obviously in yellow. The Muscungus Bay is the area where I decided to uh, use for a study site, partly because it has historical records, landings records for LYs dating back to the 1920s, uh, the same period as my data set for cod. So that gave me a really good solid place to start. In addition, cod disappeared from that location in 1962, 30 years before the larger collapse occurred in the northern Gulf of Maine proper. The next question was to find out where Elwes and Herring were and whether they disappeared in 1962. And because there is very little information that was useful, um, I leaned on the, the uh, New Ham Maine, New Hampshire Coastal Trawl Survey results. But before you go on, uh, northern, in northern Gulf of Maine, elwives and herring are a little bit unique in that their adults and older uh, juveniles migrate south every fall and they don't return until the following spring, which means that there's no way that they could have been the lipid-rich prey that would have attracted cod close to shore. Only their young of year and a few juveniles are left behind as a winter prey base. Uh, so I plotted uh, from the main coastal New Hampshire trawl survey uh, two areas uh, that showed large concentrations of elwives, young of year elwives, every fall uh, over a 10 year period. Uh, that's the yellow circles. Doesn't mean that was the only place there were young of year elwives in the area or juvenile Atlantic herring, but those two areas had concentrations of elwive fingerlings every year. So I plotted the movement patterns of uh, my 1920s COD database and found that, that's the red square, the red arrows. I found that those that were in close proximity to those circles moved inside. You'll also notice that there were a lot of codfish. That's these other arrows that aren't going towards the circles, we're going in other directions, possibly pursuing adult herring and adult elwives down the bay, as is their behavior in the fall. Uh, well, when you get down to the bottom of this, you have to say, this kind of seems like it agrees with the results that Rose and Richardson were talking about. Cod were attracted and to and stayed near these concentrations of young of year LY fingerlings. And the historical database showed that they didn't go anywhere through the winter. Uh, so it's a, good, uh, it's a good sign, perhaps. Well, the plot thickens. When you take the historical spawning study uh, done back in 2007, uh, 1997, sorry, 
lost a decade there. Um, the red areas show where fishermen said they caught ripe cod. Great. How does this align with the circled areas where supposedly cod moved to the Elwife area in the fall? Uh, because I couldn't leave it alone, I checked it, and this is what I found. An interesting relationship. Um, it may have been pure coincidence. It may be that the ripe cod that fishermen were telling me they were catching there were almost ripe, and they were there at the dinner pail feeding prior to reproducing. In either case, it's a coincidence that's made me uncomfortable ever since I've seen it. But it shows that there is an interesting correlation there. Uh, you end up saying, is this just an e another ecological hotspot? Or is it another facet of the Rose and Richardson observation with Capelin and Sandlands. Well, in 1962, this all changed. Muscungus Bay landings of Elwise dropped by more than half, ended up with, uh, that should be 700,000, not 70. It went from 1.8 million to 0 .8, uh, 0 0.7 million. Main landings of juvenile Atlantic herring, this was the heyday of the sardine industry, dropped from 75,000 metric tons down to about 30. Muscungus Bay cod disappeared. So did the haddock that were in the area. So did the pollock and white hake, which never did stay particularly close at the same time. It was a major change. But that wasn't the only place that happened, but there was one place south of Vinyl Haven, an area called uh, Matinica Seal Island, where uh, codfish were still abundant. That's just slightly east of where uh, Muscungus Bay cod were, and uh, it coincidentally was also in an area where the bottom was too rough uh, for uh, conventional methods for catching herring. At that time, it was stop saining. There were plenty of herring there, and those herring lasted in that area for another decade and a half. Had Muscungus Bay behaved like Rhodes and Richardson predicted, by dispersing when local lipid-rich prey declined in one place and simply re-aggregated in another area where there were large concentrations of lipid-rich prey, in this case herring, bordering Seal Island? Well, if you look at the history, you find that a similar thing happened back in the post-Civil War period, when uh, U.S. Commissioner of Fisheries Baird reported to Congress that construction of dams ahead of tide had blocked off spawning runs of LYs, causing them to collapse, and in turn, cod no longer returned to the shore because they had inadequate numbers of prey. Well, in northern Maine, that prey were fingling LYs and fingling herring. But he also observed that the cod fishery continued somewhat farther offshore. Very interesting. So let's summarize. In the 1870s, uh, cod groups disappeared after Elwife runs to New all of New England's major rivers collapsed. Cod spawning groups left Muscungus Bay when young of year Elwives and juvenile herring uh, dropped sharply in the 1960s. In the mid-1990s, uh, 
1995, I think, the Russian processor Riga was camped over somewhere on the si Rockland side of the bay, processing landings of herring by uh, American fishermen. Uh, they overfished the Penobscot Bay herring stock. Uh, the herring stock collapsed. The codfish that once were still reproducing on Jeffrey's Bank disappeared. With no local cod reproduction occurring in uh, northern Gulf of Maine, cod disappeared from the entire northern coastal shelf. Yikes, that's us. From Casco Bay to Canada today, there still ain't no cod. Think of it. That's a big hunk of this state. It seems clear that the cod fishery in northern New England, dear old state of Maine, depended heavily on local reproduction. Uh, the, um, and the coastal nodes that produced each year class of local cod appears to have been tightly linked to the abundance of locally available lipid-rich prey, e.g. fingerling alewives and fingerling herring. The linkage appears to have been important in attracting cod, but also in keeping their spawning groups inshore all year long. There's another interesting factor that one might consider too, because juvenile cod in their uh, first couple of years of existence are almost strictly invertebrate, uh, uh, consume invertebrates, not fish. When they start to mature and gonadal development proceeds, they have a great need for lipid-rich prey. Um, and when you consider that, you have to look at the size of maturing cod and the size of the available prey if they weren't dealing with uh, adults. If you have a cod that's anywhere from a foot and a half to two feet long, uh, fish that are over a foot long or approximately a foot long is not an ideal prey for them. But their fingerlings, which measure about three inches long, both for elwives and juvenile herring, the critters that are available al along the main coast at the same at, at, during the excuse me during the winter time, uh, they're ideal. And if you eliminate or severely reduce the number of those young of year. Uh, maturing juvenile cod either starve or move away. And that's what we've been seeing with juvenile cod along the coast. They're not abundant, but they're caught uh, consistently in lobster traps, for example, until they're about a foot and a half, two feet long. Uh, but by the time they're maturing, they're gone. Well, letting robust stocks of LYs rebuild will change the bottleneck for maturing cod and every other small and medium-sized predator on the coast. Uh, it's a good sign. It should greatly change the coastal prey base in winter, and this suggests that cod would once again be attracted to inshore areas where these young of year alewives gather in the fall. Equally important, however, is these are all, oh, I'm, I'm running by my point here. I've circled the spawning areas that will be affected by a restoration of the Kennebec Penobscot River and St. Croix River systems. It's like 
totally win-win situation. It's an incredible opportunity. And the reality is we may not know what species do come back, but if you create conditions for the species you want, at least you have a chance in seeing them return. But equally important, however, is that <clears throat> these are all local scale ecological events that determine what size these populations of fish are. And there's growing recognition that if debacles like the Gulf of Maine cod collapse are ever to be avoided or even reversed, then management must develop tools at local and intermediate ecological scales to supplement the current system-wide management approach in place. Uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ted. So, questions? We've got a few minutes. Hi, Ted. Um, just a question, have the, those three rivers been reopened, or are, I know the Penobscot, uh, they took a dam down there, but are you saying that uh, all three of those, those rivers are now doing some restoration? Uh, a great question, Emily. Uh, thanks for asking it. Uh, the truth is, uh, it, they're open a little bit. Uh, the Kennebec is my favorite because it's been open for a decade uh, now, and it has gone from runs of somewhere around 30 to 50,000 per year to 3.2 million the last I heard. I'm not sure what it is this year. Phenomenal recovery. But when you consider that juvenile, that for every adult female that gets to reproduce, uh, it'll produce anywhere from 12, 1400 to 2700 fingerlings per adult female. Uh, that's a whole lot of babies coming down the river. And the Penobscot, now, most of the East Branch is open. It opens a thousand miles of habit, spawning habitat for either bluebacks, uh, which are very closely related to uh, alewives, uh, or alewives. That's, uh, that's estimated that it will produce somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to 12 million adult uh, runs of that size every year. That's substantial. Uh, it's already started. Uh, the catch being uh, it will increase in four-year intervals because that's how long it takes for the first year uh, for the crop of fingerlings going down the river to grow and mature and return back to reproduce. So you'll go in four to five year jumps and this will continue until the spawning habitat is saturated. Uh, it may be more and it could be less, but it's hard to tell. The St. Croix is a wild card because it potentially is the largest producer of LYs on the coast simply because most of the system is open. And uh, some of us are hoping, uh, some of us that are hoping are hoping we last long enough to see this come back, but I look for some phenomenal changes. Yeah, Ted, I noticed that in the Penobscot region you didn't include the union. Is that because that, that's been dammed up for so long that you didn't have documentation because uh, if you do the math on that one, that can produce seven, eight million if you open up the entire watershed that was historically open for uh, sea run fish. Yeah, good question, Chubb. Uh, you'll notice in the portrayal of spawning sites that there's one obvious vacancy, and that's in the Mount Desert Island region. Uh, the Union River, which flows through Ellsworth, is the fourth largest uh, river system in the state uh, and is presently closed by a 62-foot high dam and the Graham Dam up the river. 
and I'm not sure where that goes, but if you could open that up and get passage of uh, diadromous fish back into that system, uh, I think the fish would take care of themselves. Uh, there's a projection that you could get anywhere from uh, four to eight million fish per year coming out of there. Uh, that would revitalize Blue Hill Bay and probably wouldn't hurt uh, Frenchman's Bay either. It's a phenomenal opportunity, not just for ground fishermen who would like to catch fish closer to home, but also for salmon and stripers and that whole suite of species that occupy these habitats. Um, it's a great, great chance. Uh, at the kind of most macro level, you, you obviously read a lot in the newspapers about overfishing and, and it's presumed that that's sort of the, the basic problem, but you're sort of saying, no, it's a, it's a supply issue from the dams being blocked and there's not enough food. So do you have, a, at the highest level, a sense of, well, what, what percentage of the problem of the disappearance of cod is due to overfishing versus loss of the uh, food source? Um, I can, but uh, starting to get into a real uh, can of worms when, when you do. Overfishing is the problem, but part of the problem is because they've taken the Gulf of Maine, the upper part of it, of which we're central, uh, some 35,000 square miles, and to assess codfish, they send out survey cruises and sample a bajillion different sites, random stratified sampling, take this information, get an estimate of total population, and say, you can, you can uh, take a certain percentage of them. So fishermen go out and find where there's a concentration of cod, and they fish hell out of it, and they flatten it and then they move on, because they've got a 35,000 square mile area to operate in. And in fact, most ground fish boats that are surviving today uh, operate in the entire 65,000 square mile area that includes George's Bank as well. Uh, so part of the problem, a large part of it, is that we need to make the management unit uh, at least be very similar, if not fit properly, the scale that the species of fish is operating in. And I examined this in, an, in another paper I did a little while ago uh, and found that these subpopulations of fish that you saw in the second or third slide, where you just had three or four big circles on a chart, uh, those were constrained by benthic geology. The shape of the bottom determined where those fish were. And if they drew management lines to that, then you could address much of what's happened. Because we've, as an industry, have pulse fish, concentrations of fish everywhere. Uh, good question. There's about a month-long conversation that could go with it. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Ted, again. Thank you.